Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you very much for joining us for today's uh, discussion, for today's Friday SLO talk. My name is Yara Kiano and I am a faculty coordinator from Santa Ana College School of Continuing Education. Uh, step number three in the guide to, assess, to student learning assessment, course SLO alignment to program and institutional SLOs. Well, it's an important topic because assessment of course program and institutional learning outcomes can only happen at the course level. Student persistence, attendance, GPAs, diploma attainment rates, even exit surveys are not measures of student learning. Faculty are the experts in their classrooms and they're the only ones on campus who can attest to what students actually learn. So what really matters is a careful design of assessment activities that would help students realize not only what they learn in a course, but how acquisition of skills and competencies in courses has a ripple effect on their program and institutional learning outcomes. Uh, students need to be told specifically what they learn in the course and how their learning enables them to be successful completing programs and graduating from our institutions. As always, I'm grateful for the contribution from my colleagues, the coaches and guests who are here to present how alignment of course program and institutional learning outcomes plays out in our campuses. Um, welcome again. Enrique, please take it away. Thank you, Yarek. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everyone. In front of you, you have the agenda uh, for step number three, uh, the presenters. Uh, can you please introduce yourself in the wave order? Bethany. Good morning. My name is Bethany Tasaka. Uh, I represent San Bernardino Valley College in Southern California, um, but today I'm coming to you from Washington, D.C. I'm at a conference with our student government. Um, I am the curriculum chair and outcomes faculty lead at my college, um, and officially I'm math faculty, but I'm, I'm not teaching right now. So, Thank you, Bethany. Shannon. Good morning, my name is Shannon Jess and I'm coming to you as a representative of Chafee College and we are located in Rancho Cucamonga, California. I'm a biology faculty member. I'm also the student learning outcomes faculty tri-chair and biology department coordinator. Thank you. Tricia. Hi everyone, great to be with you this morning. Uh, my name is Trisha Wilging. I am, uh, well, I teach in the reading and teacher preparation department at Long Beach City College, and I'm also the student learning outcomes coordinator. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Holmgren, Director of Planning at Long Beach City College, um, and I work really closely with Trisha to support um, SLO assessment. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your support and collaboration. Um, Zadik. All right, well, we are going to start with Bethany, right? You're, you're first up. So again, Bethany, we, we, we are just so appreciative of the fact that you're joining us from Washington DC. So we completely understand the technical difficulties uh, If should, should, should there any be. Um, again, thank you so much for your contribution, please. <laughs> Don't jinx me, all right, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, hopefully no technical difficulties. We'll see what happens. Um, so today what we're looking at is aligning our SLOs with program and institutional learning outcomes. Um, and again, I'm, I'm from San Bernardino Valley College. Um, so I, I kind of thought um, just a overview of kind of how my college does this would be helpful. So there's three kind of ways that everything maps within, you know, all of our outcomes. Um, we have an SLO to PLO mapping, um, and I'm going to show you examples of these in a moment of, of what we actually have given faculty and what it kind of looks like. Um, but we, the first and probably most you know, clear pathway that we see is from SLOs to PLOs. And so what that means is you take the student learning outcomes from the actual course. Some people call them course student learning outcomes or CLOs, kind of variations of that. And we ask, how do they fit into the larger outcomes of your program? So you take, um, you know, maybe a, I think I have a Spanish class that we're looking at in a moment, and you take the individual outcomes and then match them to kind of the bigger overarching idea of, well, what do you want students to learn once they finish your degree or once they finish your certificate um, or maybe you're ready to transfer? Um, 
So that's one way to do it. And then those PLOs should map up into your institutional learning outcomes. Um, and again, you might have a slight variety in what you call it, but our campus calls it institutional learning outcomes. Um, and we approach that as once the student is done being a student with us. Um, ideally, that means that they have graduated, that they've transferred. Um, it really should be a very holistic look at, at what that student is able to do by the time that they're finished. Um, you know, again, whether they transfer or graduate, um, it, it really, at least for us, it really doesn't represent the student who came to take one class, um, who, who didn't really intend to get a complete, you know, uh, experience with us or a complete education with us because um, you know we all have those students they'll come back for one or two classes here or there they're not really there for a full degree or certificate um, so institutional is meant to be you know kind of a, a big picture um, and then there's going to be some courses and this is the last part the there's going to be some courses that maybe don't fit perfectly into a program um, maybe there isn't an actual degree um, right now we do not have an asl american sign language uh, degree but it's a very popular class so because there's no program for those to fit in um, at, which would be this top case up here right align with plos well they may not have those plos right but they could actually just map straight up into the institutional learning outcomes. Um, so we we say this word map and uh, I've, I've had to catch myself a few times because when I started in my outcomes faculty lead position, that would get said to me all the time, oh, you just map it. What does that mean? What are you talking about, right? Um, and and it's almost like a um, almost like a table. I can kind of show you what I mean on the next page, but it's really just asking how do these things align with each other? So if I took any P, uh, any student learning outcome from a class, and I took a program learning outcome from a degree or certificate, what's the overlap between them? So the skills that you're learning in the class, how does that overlap with the skills you're learning in the degree? And you kind of think of it like building up. So you have all these courses that build into a program, right? Students are going to take all these individual classes, but collectively those skills get them to what they need for a degree or certificate or a certificate. Um, and then that degree or certificate, you take what they've learned again, kind of in this complete holistic approach. And you say, well, that aligns with what we as an institution value that students should be able to do once they're done with us, right? Um, and then for those SLOs that are left over, okay, they may not fit into a program, but they still are part of the big picture. How do we see that alignment? So sometimes I'll use the word map, it's kind of a default, but I know it's not always the most intuitive word um, when we're kind of dipping our toes into this whole process. Um, and feel free to ask questions. Uh, I, I trust you all to <laughs> monitor the chat. So um, so one, one approach that we kind of have for this is we, we put this little outcomes tree together. Um, we're, we're trying as a campus to kind of normalize outcomes as an overall kind of uh, label for all these different types of outcomes that we have. And we really did not want this to come across um, as a top-down kind of thing. We really didn't want it to be, well, the institution says you have to do this, therefore your programs have to do this, and therefore your classes have to do this. We didn't want, that's why institutional is kind of at the base, we didn't want it to come across like, well, the college says you must do this in your classroom. We know there's a lot of things we have to abide by. We know there's a lot of, you know, processes and, you know, articulation things that outside people kind of have a voice in, but we really wanted to make it about the relationship amongst all of these different types of outcomes. Um, we're mainly focusing on these branches out here to the right. Um, we're not talking about service area outcomes today. Some places might call those student services outcomes, um, but we really wanted to treat the institutional learning outcomes as kind of the trunk of your tree, the foundation of what it is, and and understanding if this is kind of the roots, the, the foundation of it, I know my biology, biology people are kind of rolling their eyes at me right now, but that's okay. Um, if this is the foundation, we wanna think about how we grow out from there. So from the institution, we have all these different programs, right? We have all these different degrees and certificates our students could take. We also, within that, there's all these courses that make it up. And so we really want to think of it as this kind of branching out approach um, and how they all relate to each other. Um, and so this is kind of our little, our little cute tree. You know, we kind of took a, like a family tree model from it, but um, it's how we're trying to get uh, the conversation around outcomes. Uh, we're, we're trying to get it to center around this kind of an idea. Um, 
Okay, so here's an example of part of a map. I have this is a two page part, but um, what we've done, and we're, we're in a transitional phase right now where we're moving from, we had actual just paper formatting for this, but we're moving into um, CurricuNet Meta. Um, it's our curriculum website where all of our course outlines of record are housed. And we're lucky enough to have a piece of this where we can build in uh, outcomes. So we, we, what we used to do, and again, we're kind of transitioning, but what we used to do is send them a Word document with our institutional learning outcomes on there. And so here are our five institutional learning outcomes. Um, we actually reviewed them. I don't even think it's been a whole year yet. I think it was December of last year. Um, so these are relatively new for us. We had not reviewed them in, I want to say, at least a decade prior to that. So it was, it was time to just ask what's important to us as a college. Um, and, and we were really trying to be inclusive and thoughtful in that process of developing these. We wanted to make sure um, a lot of our areas who I think tend to feel a little marginalized could see themselves in at least one. Um, so CTE, for example, we wanted to make sure CTE could could at least feel, you know, okay, I, I see myself in communication skills or um, personal academic career responsibilities. And it doesn't have to be all CTE in all categories, but just giving them an idea. Um, and the one that we're really proud of is, is having this, uh, you know, students uh, impact of one's actions on the environment and role in society with respect to diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. So when we put these together, and I can show you some more examples towards the end, but when we put these together, the actual institutional learning outcomes are the second row right here. But it was important to us to have some examples and samples of what that might look like because it gives context. Um, what could it mean to have mastered these communication skills as a graduate or a transfer student? What does that look like? What does it mean to have quantitative reasoning skills? And, and the easy answer to quantitative reasoning is it's just math, right? But we know that's not the one and only place where quantitative reasoning happens. And so we wanted to make sure things like data and understanding, you know, graphics and um, technical problems, those were all kind of looped in the mix as well. So faculty get this list of what their institutional learning outcomes are with these kind of um, sample skills built into it. And we also wanted to make sure they followed that Bloom's tax taxonomy language and our SLO rubric from last week's presentation. Um, and then they get a list of their, their PLOs, that's this first table up here. So we have um, five program learning outcomes. This is a Spanish um, transfer degree. Um, you can see one through five in the rows. And then over here in the columns, we have ILOs one through five. And so what we ask the faculty to do is take your first program learning outcome and just we need at least one mark in each row. Now, Spanish chose really just one per row. And we said, that's fine. It just, we wanna make sure it aligns with at least one. But we do have other departments where everything was checked. And, and where we are right now as a college, we said, you know what, that's fine. Because that's, we just wanna make sure you're thinking about bigger picture and, and how this relates to the campus. So um, this is one end of the spectrum. We sure had other ones where just check marks were everywhere. That's fine. Um, the other thing that we asked them to do is we asked them to align uh, courses with those PLOs. I didn't have enough to fit uh, three, four, and five again on this chart, but you can get the idea from one and two. Um, so the first PLO, again, demonstrate proficiency in the skill of speaking, reading, writing, and comprehension of academic standard Spanish. And we asked them, okay, these are the courses that live in your program. Tell us which courses achieve that outcome, that program outcome. Um, and you can see there's duplicates. So Spanish 101 is listed both on one and two. It might be three, four, and five. Like I said, I cut that off. Um, but this is also a question that came up. Uh, if you were here last week, they asked about aligning things that are not from the actual discipline, right? Um, so you can see Spanish chose to put English 163, History 140, and History 150 in alignment with this PLO, they felt that it was important and related to what students were learning in that program. 
So this is one way that you can do the maps. Um, it took a bit of time to set up. I'll be very honest about that. Um, and I don't know that it's perfect by any means. It's just what fits our needs at the moment. Um, but what we did is we just highlighted these areas and we said, okay, you know, we did a, a couple of trainings. I did a lot of one-on-ones with faculty. We just need you to fill in the yellow parts. Um, so it was very clear on what they had to do. And then our curriculum coordinator, that's the, the classified specialist that works with us, went in behind the scenes and then she updates all this on the back end. But we tried to make it very user friendly for faculty. Um, I think because of the way we kind of operate as a system, there's not a lot of prep for us that goes into something like this, right? So, so it, as part of your degree, as part of your studies, you don't necessarily learn about things like outcomes and writing good outcomes and mapping them. It's just not part of our training. I took a whole bunch of math classes that have nothing to do with this at all. So we really wanted to make it to, 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 we wanted to bring it to a place where it wasn't this added thing where they had to go and they had to learn all this extra stuff just to make sense of it. So it was a little more work on our end. We were trying to make faculty's lives easier and a little more direct. Um, one area we're moving into, and I did cheat a little bit. I borrowed this from my presentation last week, but um, one area we're moving into, and it's it's with um, aligning the individual course SLOs with the broader institutional learning outcomes. Um, this is a math class. It's not part of our degree because it's an independent study course. But what we have them do right now, and this is our transition into that Curricky Net Meta system, is when they type in that outcome, they automatically have the ability to check which institutional learning outcomes it meets. So instead of having a table like this, and this is the PLO version, but instead of having a table like this at the top, they get one outcome at a time, and you could see another one kind of at the bottom of that table, and they just check the box. So it's a similar process. It just looks a little different. Um, and then if it was part of a degree, they would have the, uh, they would have, be able to fill in the PLOs as well. So it'd be two sets of checks for them to do. Um, so this is where we're moving. And then this will show up in the course outline of record. Every outcome, it'll put right underneath it, which program learning outcomes and which institutional learning outcomes it maps to. So it's really clear for people to see that. Um, so in terms of how to talk to faculty about this, um, I, I definitely think we have areas to grow. I don't, you know, we're not in a perfect place with this. We're still working on how to develop systems, but I think a great conversation to have with your faculty is, what is the point of an institutional learning outcome? I don't think a student learning outcome for your course level or a program learning outcome, those aren't as big of a hard sell because they work with their programs, they work with their classes more often. But sometimes the institutional learning outcome is a little like, eh, that, that's not my thing. I don't have to worry about that, right? So really having a conversation about, well, what are institutional learning outcomes and, and how do we view them as a campus? How do we use them as a campus? What even are they? I think that's a really good place to start with your faculty. Um, again, it's kind of going back to that place of not assuming that they know this because not a lot of us have been trained in this area. Um, at least I wasn't. Um, another thing to consider is just have you reviewed your institutional learning outcomes? Um, I inherited mine and spent a little bit of time kind of with them as they were and then said, I don't I don't think these are up to date anymore. I think we really need to update them and talk about them as a campus. Um, so we've established a review cycle with them where we review them after each accreditation or actually before each accreditation visit. That was a, a key point. Um, so before we have an accreditation visit from our body, our accrediting body, we're gonna take a moment and look at our institutional learning outcomes and say, do these still fit or do we need to update them? what's the impact of doing that? So if we change an institutional learning outcome, that affects all those maps that we put together. And that's an important thing to consider as well, um, because you don't want to do it so frequently that your faculty, probably especially your chairs, are burnt out by having to change constantly. That's also difficult. If you do decide to change, really be conscious of the voices that you have in the room. Your academic senate should absolutely be involved or your faculty senate, but make sure it's not just instructional voices that you hear. 
because at least the way my college operates, these institutional learning outcomes also affect student services areas. They affect our writing center, they affect our tutoring center, they affect EOPS and CalWORKs and all these other areas. They should have a voice as well. So make sure it is faculty driven, outcomes are faculty driven, but we don't have to be the only voices in the room. Um, and I would even, if you're gonna review and update them, I would bring those voices onto your committee, subcommittee, whatever that looks like to make sure that they're heard. Um, and again, look for some of those disciplines that um, you know might not always feel as represented. I know for us, I think that's CTE, they're not always, um, I think because their classes, they're very busy, right? And they're always like, wait, we never heard about that. We didn't know, or this doesn't apply to us. We don't write papers all day, you know? And so it's looping them in and making sure they feel like they're part of it. Um, I would also put some examples together. So when you have your institutional learning outcomes, and I'll just show you what this looks like on our website, at least I hope I will. Um, I don't, don't know what that is. Um, but bring examples. So here's our institutional learning outcomes page. The institutional institutional learning outcomes exactly as is, and we put who they were approved by and when. So it hasn't been quite a year, but then we put examples. So here's those skills that were on that table relating to communication skills. But then we actually went in and we found a sample program learning outcome that fits the institutional learning outcome. We found a student learning outcome that fits that one. And we found a service area outcome that fits. And we were really conscious again, we wanted to make sure that- Anthony? Oh yeah. Um, are you sharing the- Oh, am I not sharing? No, you're not. Thank you. How's that? Is that better? Yes. No. Okay, I can circle I'm back. Sorry. So here's the institutional learning outcomes. And then this first part, um, this is what was on that table that student, that, um, that faculty received. But then we picked sample outcomes. So when we picked outcomes, these are existing ones that somebody, you know, somebody wrote for their program, somebody wrote for a course, and somebody wrote for an area. And we wanted to be, um, we wanted to make sure at least one student services was represented amongst these three, and at least one CTE was represented amongst these three. And then everything else kind of, uh, you know, we, theater art happened to fit this one really well. We kind of wanted to give slightly out of the box examples um, of what communication looks like, where theater art, right, that is a form of communicating. And we kind of, we were trying to think of it in an empowering way. Um, where faculty could see themselves or, or people working with outcomes could see themselves in these areas where they may not traditionally see themselves. Um, and you, I can share these, uh, I shared these with Enrique already, so you're welcome to kind of browse our site. Um, but again, making sure, you know, we had machine technology, our financial aid office, and then a business class. Um, and just taking from what people already put together. Yeah, that, that was the intent, Amanda. We really wanted to make sure that people, it, it wasn't just instructional. And I, I don't know about your campuses, but that is feedback we hear often. Um, oh, it's just a faculty thing. They don't care about, you know, the people who do SAOs. It's like, no, we really do care. We want, that's why we're trying to normalize outcomes. We're trying to make sure that everybody feels like they can see themselves. Um, okay, so let me go back here. I think that was very close to the end. Um, I've, I've been trying to approach things from, you know, kind of what could have gone better, you know, <laughs> kind of approach. Um, you know, we're trying a lot of different things and some things work really beautifully and not everything works beautifully. So I'm trying to kind of use that lens here. Um, and I, I also think I borrowed most of this from last week's, but it still applies here. Um, make sure you honor what your faculty know. Make sure you honor their discipline expertise, right? So our, our jobs are not to go in and say, you know, hey, listen, English, this is how you should do things. It's no, you, you know English, your discipline better than I do, but here's how I can support you in outcomes. Here's how I can help you with mapping. Um, because sometimes we don't see, you know, or faculty may not see how that connects to a PLO or how that connects to an ILO. And so that's where we can help them see that. Um, really, really encourage teamwork. So when you, you know, take this to departments, say, hey, make this part of a department meeting, make this part of a department workday. Um, I will go to you and I will sit on your Zoom call or in your office and 
watch until you need me. That's usually what I say. Like I am, I am just here to support you do all the talking and I'll chime in if you need me. Um, but really encourage them, you know, Hey, this is a team effort. It's not just one person. Cause that's how you get buy-in. Um, always think about the student's voice. Always think about how equity is being represented. Um, I know that that's a bigger conversation that's happening around, uh, California for sure. I think other parts of the U.S. I hope other parts of the U.S. and beyond. Um, but really thinking about from the student perspective, right? If we tell students, these are what our institution values. These are the things you should know when you either transfer or graduate, then mean it. Make sure they're valuable skills that students can actually use and actually demonstrate and then follow up with it. Make sure your programs align with it. Make sure your courses align with it. Um, and then Again, sometimes we always, or not always, sometimes we like to kind of make a mountain out of a molehill, right? We don't have to get it perfectly right all the time. That's this idea of continuous quality improvement. Try to let your faculty know, of course, we want to do a good job. And of course, we want to get it right as often as we can. But just like when we're in the classroom or when we're on the job, it's not going to be perfect every time. We're going to make mistakes and that's okay, but it's always about that reflection process. How can I do this differently? How can I improve next time? And that's that continuous quality improvement term that we like to use. Um, and then I believe that's all I have. Um, so that's all that I have. Um, there's my contact info. I could put my email in the chat as well. Um, but yeah, are there any, I, I see the chat yes. had some questions. Go ahead. Bethany? Yes. Uh I will go to the chat. Um, yes, um, I can. Oh my God, where's my chat? Um, there was a questions regarding, you know, uh, you do them every three or four years. Uh, so, what was the purpose of that? And, and how often do you do that? And if so, what type of changes, you know? Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, our, our college, Right now, outcomes actually live under the accreditation committee. Um, that's not very normal. Usually when I say that, people kind of make a face at me and go, that, that's a weird choice, but it's what it's what it is for now. Um, and so our choice was we review them every time, um, just before an accreditation visit. So those are always um, known in advance. There's not, usually it shouldn't be a surprise. We can't really prep if it is, but if we know there's gonna be an accreditation visit in next fall, then we should be reviewing our outcomes in the spring that leads into it. That's what works for our college. Um, we didn't put a year on it because that accreditation visit could have a different result. Um, we were lucky enough to get a seven year um, approval or whatever accreditation approval for the last rotation. Um, so we will not be reviewing ours until almost the end of that seven years. Um, but if the next time around, knock on wood, this doesn't happen, but if it's a shorter number, we would review it short in a, a shorter time period. Um, and, and honestly, it's really just reading them and asking, do they still fit? So it could be a small change. It could be a much larger change, but it's just, it's just that question of, is this still what we value as an institution when it comes to the skills our students can demonstrate? So I don't know if that perfectly answers your question. Yes, it does. It does. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, uh, Amanda, would you like to chime in? Uh, nope, nothing beyond what I put in the, the, the chat. Thank you, thank you. Uh, without further ado, uh, Shannon Jensen, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Let me, um, I'm going to adjust some screen sharing here. I have to wing okay, and hopefully yes. I'm Very internet connecting. Okay. Uh, all right, so today I'm gonna to be describing uh, the purpose, process, and impact of what we call alignment. And sometimes there's different words used like um, mapping or nesting. Um, and I'm gonna use Chafee College and a couple of examples from our own courses as an example of how we in our local ass assessment cycle bring in this process. Um, regardless of the terminology that you wanna use, um, the idea is that course and program and institutional outcomes are intentionally connected to one another with the ultimate goal that students taking any course are learning skills and concepts to enhance uh, success in their academic and career pathways. And so as uh, Bethany was just alluding to, this kind of falls under develop, 
re revise and periodically review learning outcomes in our, so this, the, what you're looking at on the screen is our sort of local um, sort of assessment cycle process. And so this is uh, the yellow star is meant to indicate kind of where this alignment process falls in, in that cycle. And so um, a little bit like uh, Bloom's taxonomy, the outcomes of these levels build upon one another. And the idea is that upon completion of all their coursework, the whole student is greater than the sum of the course SLOs that they have learned, right? An intentional alignment of course program and institutional outcomes ensures that as the students are developing acumen within each course SLO, they're ideally connecting these learning outcomes together across the curriculum, that they're gaining competencies, not only in their desired field of study, but also through their gen ed pattern and building a cohesive set of skills and competencies. Um, so we can define and distinguish each of these levels um, discreetly, like I've done on the screen there. Um, but again, ensuring ultimately that whatever their career and academic pathway ultimately will be, that the students are readily prepared. Um, so generally speaking, I'm, I don't like reading slides, um, but the way institutional learning outcomes are defined is in broad and cross-curricular terms. Um, they should be reinforced across the entire program of study and aggregated um, over the series of general ed courses, prerequisites, and sequenced courses that the students might be taking. Um, and they may also be influenced by external accreditation requirements as well. Um, program outcomes are a cohesive set of discipline relevant knowledge and skills, um, again, aggregated over a series of courses, um, but usually more localized within a particular major. And then, of course, the course learning outcomes, these are um, demonstrated through the completion of curriculum for an individual course and typically would include a variety of formative and summative assessments. Um, and not included on this slide are course objectives, which are the discrete granular activities and assignments that are part of a unit or a learning module. But they should all align, is, is the point. Um, one other thing I want to say while I'm at this sort of defining um, concept is um, we encountered some challenges and we continue to encounter them um, in curriculum review. It um, is that it's important to distinguish between program learning outcomes and program outcomes. So we see things like, um, you know, 80% of our students will pass such and such standard exam, like the um, national nursing licensing exam. And it's like, that's not a learning outcome. That's a program outcome that you want 80% of your students to pass the licensing exam. What we really want to see instead of that is what is it that students are successfully demonstrating in terms of competencies and capabilities after completion of the nursing courses. And I'm not trying to pick on my nursing uh, program because they're amazing, but it's just an outcome that we see um, frequently that's not really a program learning outcome. It's it's a it's a target, it's, a, it's something that they want to achieve, but it's different, I think, from learning outcomes. All right, so, um, and just as an overview of what alignment means, um, so all outcomes are student learning outcomes, but there's certainly a progression. Um, and we assess at the level of course SLOs, but, but we can actually, assess higher order learning outcomes at the level of the course. Um, we don't simply have to restrict ourselves to assessing course SLOs, um, particularly if the alignment is intentional. And likewise, assessment of program and institutional learning outcomes need not be restricted to these things that um, I think were alluded to at the very beginning before um, we started presenting. So things like exit interviews and surveys and retrospectives and those sorts of things. Um, they give us important information, but it's also possible possible to directly assess 
um, program and institutional outcomes, even at the course level. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the purpose of alignment. Um, because at Chafee and probably at many colleges, learning outcomes assessment was born out of accreditation mandates. Um, and for our accreditation body, it the you know the mandates were okay, there have to be three to five course SLOs. Um, they have to be assessed on, on a sort of regular basis. And then the assessment data has to be used um, to make program improvements. And so that be, that kind of resulted in a very transactional approach, um, an approach for compliance, an approach to check boxes and say, yes, we wrote our SLOs, yes, we are assessing them, and yes, we are using that assessment data. Um, but, and I think some of our departments and programs had a more robust approach than others. And I, even for those departments, though, I think when I stepped into the role of Outcomes and Assessment Committee, uh, tri chair, I saw that, you know, meeting the accreditation requirements really seemed unintentionally to result in this very superficial approach to SLOs. And there was a lot of sort of artificial reverse engineering being done to close the loop. Um, and so the purpose of alignment really is about going from this sort of um, transactional box checking approach to um, creating a framework for authentic assessment that's embedded throughout the existing curriculum, um, providing evidence and examples of what our students are doing to show that they're meeting these outcomes to more meaningful close the loop. Um, and then of course, um, as Bethany was speaking to, um, this is resulting in a lot of revision of learning outcomes at all levels, um, course program and institutional. And so I wanna just show you, you don't need to memorize these or worry about them, but this is an example from one of the courses that I teach, physiology. Um, and I just want to show you, um, these are the, our three to five learning outcomes that were required. They're in our course outline of record. Um, we assessed them according to our department plan and we reported the data back and so forth. Um, but the SLOs themselves don't really reflect what we want students to learn in physiology, and they're not particularly clear or measurable. Um, and I would also argue that the assessments we were engaging in were not particularly meaningful. So, you know, again, you don't need to worry about memorizing these, but I want to show you what they look like before alignment and then after. Okay, so let's let's dive into what the process of alignment looked like at Chafee. So if you're wanting kind of a step-by-step -step approach, you can maybe make note of these steps. Our first step was starting with program SLOs. And this was an intentional uh, first step. Um, so we wanted programs to write three to five program uh, learning outcomes. And this was required in as part of program review. And so starting at the program level, aligned with our guided pathways efforts, it provided context for faculty who were writing these outcomes because it's close enough to their discipline that they were comfortable writing them and it gave them a chance to reflect on what the collective um, outcome should be for a program of study. Um, and then also it had the effect of helping the faculty appreciate the space that their own courses occupied within that program. Um, and so, you know, was it a, was it part of a program map? Where did it fit in that map? Was it part of, was the course part of a degree or certificate or a major sequence? Was it um, used to fulfill gen ed requirements and so forth? So with that context in mind, um, you know, for biology department, for example, we actually broke out into teams because although the biology program is one uh, whole, we actually have three sort of sub programs. And so we have our biology majors, our gen ed courses and our pre allied health and each of those sort of groupings has its own unique program outcomes. So we, we weren't required to do that, but that's how we broke it out. Um, 
And so we, we as faculty uh, got together in our individual groups, we wrote our program uh, learning outcomes and uh, what this, so the, the, the example I'm using today is from our pre-allied health courses because that's where physiology fits in. Um, and this, this is part of a sequence of courses, including anatomy, physiology, and microbiology. And we started by asking the question that you see there on the screen, um, what should students know and be able to do upon completion of the courses in this program? And so when we asked that question, we arrived at this um, communication program outcome. And if you'll uh, indulge me, I'm going to go back one more time to our physiology learning outcomes. <laughs> and we'll just make note that none of these really address communication at all. <laughs> and when we thought about what is it we want our students to be able to do, we want them to be able to speak um, clearly to either healthcare professionals, future patients, or maybe even friends and family members about things that come up like vaccines or antibiotics. And so we came up with this really robust program learning outcome about communication. And even in just revising, or I should say inventing this one outcome, we knew those course SLOs were gonna be next in line to be revised. And that was a good thing. So when we tried to go to the next step, which is alignment, alignment of our course SLOs to the program learning outcomes, then we kind of had to break it down a little further. So in, in that alignment step, we noticed there was some redundancy and overlap in our course SLOs. We noted the absence of communication in every single one of them. And so the, the next step in that alignment was to identify the gaps. And then the next step after that was to make our revisions. And so there you go. Um, here's the, one of the new learning outcomes that was directly uh, a result of that process of alignment. So we created this program outcome, now we had to align it, and that meant revising our course SLO. And so here you go, effectively communicate physiological concepts in a variety of modalities and being able to um, speak to not only the physiology parts of it, but also public health uh, concepts like antibiotics and vaccines and that sort of thing. So in this revision, which we found to be a really healthy and good thing, but in this case, the learning outcome now has greater clarity about what students should be learning and how we expect them to demonstrate that learning. And um, the next step then was to align to our institutional learning outcomes. So we happen to have, um, so we asked this question again, what institutional outcomes are embodied by these course and program learning outcomes? And we found a communication um, institutional outcome that overlapped or aligned with these uh, course and program SLOs. And the mapping can either be direct from the course SLO to the institutional outcome, or it can kind of go through the program learning outcome, which would be more of an indirect mapping. And it doesn't really matter um, whether it's direct or indirect mapping. The point is that there's a thread. There's a consistency and a pattern to the way these outcomes are laid out. However, if you look at that institutional learning outcome, the blue on the screen, it's really vague. <laughs> and it doesn't really speak to skills acquisition. It just says the students will practice effective communication and comprehension skills and strategies. And it's, it's just very much not measurable. So <laughs> enter our next step, which is um, actually aligning with a different set of learning outcomes. So we had institutional learning outcomes, but it turns out they were just statements on a website. Um, and at best, they were being indirectly measured, like I said before, by these exit surveys or maybe some student interviews, um, if we were measuring them at all. Um, and so there was no substantive measurement or real data on these institutional learning outcomes, but they were being represented as the cross-curricular values and skills that students acquired through their journey at our college. So that really wasn't 
uh, sufficient in our mind. And so um, what we did was we tapped into a strong workforce grant um, to collaborate with our state chancellor's office. Um, at the time, this was called New World of Work. Um, and it was a derivative of our state chancellor's emphasis on uh, competency-based education. Um, and we actually used that strong workforce grant to rebrand these new world of work skills and develop a framework for their assessment and their alignment at Chafee College. So now we call them ACEs for Academic Community and Employability Skills. And we use the same 10 skills that were identified by New World of Work, but we sort of rewrote the learning outcomes that are associated with each skill. And that is kind of a constant and ongoing process. Uh, and I'll talk about more in a moment. And basically we developed, we hired someone to develop a Canvas framework where we could use Canvas rubrics and SpeedGrader and then roll this out to faculty to help them identify which skills and outcomes fit well with their existing curriculum. Um, and just to kind of illustrate one example of an ACE skill, the four learning outcomes that are associated with each skill, which we can assess via Canvas, and then how they align with our institutional learning outcomes. Um, and so that's kind of what this slide is showing you. So we already had some alignment between the skills and the outcomes, um, but we needed to revise that a little bit. Um, and the data from the start, we were developing our data infrastructure, which is collected by our Office of Institutional Research and then distributed to programs to evaluate what outcomes are being assessed and for which courses. And that's kind of how we prototyped uh, the ACEs um, initiative, if you will. So now we're bringing this to scale through program review. Um, and so part of that alignment process is to identify the academic community and employability skills that students are demonstrating as they complete their coursework for any given program. We had a faculty inquiry team in 2018 that identified the top three ACEs skills by what we're calling our academic and career communities. Um, we publish those skills on our website and we allow faculty to not only assess within those three skills, um, but they're also allowed to assess other outcomes that they feel organically uh, are appropriate for their curriculum. And um, ultimately that's leading to the ACEs outcomes becoming our institutional learning outcomes. Uh, so through a shared governance process, we're actually overhauling our ACEs outcomes. They essentially are replacing our existing set of learning outcomes and we're incorporating ever-changing um, emphasis like from our academic senate on social justice and environmental responsibility and so forth. Um, and so we want the institutional learning outcomes to be broad and generic enough that they can be a set, um, that they can be applicable across disciplines, but also specific enough to be measurable and um, dynamic enough that we can modify them in real time as employer trends change and as things uh, like emphasis on diversity, equity, inclusion, environmental uh, responsibility and social justice. As those values change, we wanna be able to be dynamic. And so we have to have an infrastructure to support that. So we're going through shared governance um, currently um, to align the new ACEs outcomes, which are uh, with our four categories of our institutional learning outcomes. And um, again, these revisions are going to be presented in the next few weeks to our academic senate and the shared governance, but we did collect feedback prior to this um, readjustment of our and, and reworking of the outcomes uh, to make sure that uh, we gathered feedback first and incorporated all that feedback from all our stakeholders, from student government, from students themselves, uh, from our classified staff, from our faculty, and from our administration. So everybody was involved in this process. So I just want to share what it looks like in practice, and I'll wrap this up. 
Um, so going back to physiology, we have our specific um, ACEs communication outcome at the top, and then our program learning outcome, our course learning outcome. And we can even map this to a specific topic or objective from the course content. Then the faculty member can assess whether, or excuse me, assess how a student demonstrates this, whether it's in a lab report, a research project, or even answering an exam question. Um, but that allows us to use Canvas rubrics to collect that data, assess the um, program, the course, and the institutional learning outcome with much greater impact and benefit to our students. So this is the first time that assessment of student learning outcomes actually um, can occur with an immediate benefit to students because we've also tacked on to this the ability for students to earn digital micro credentials as they demonstrate these skills in real time. So they don't have to just wait for a grade at the end of a course. They're earning digital micro credentials to demonstrate the learning outcomes that they have um, mastered. They um, are able to also have additional opportunities because they can earn these um, micro credentials in any course that they take at, at Chafee College, not just. Um, through completion of a program. Um, the faculty are able to uh, assess SLOs on an ongoing and consistent way in their courses. The discipline experts get to decide how and when and where these outcomes are assessed. And then we've got our data dashboard. Um, and so there's just all these amazing benefits for our students. And I just wanna show a tiny snippet of data and I'll be done. So we can look at longitudinal data and what this data suggests to me, I just pulled this this morning. Um, we're getting better at refining our expectations over time. As we went from prototyping this to actually implementing the assessments, we're getting a little more um, nuanced in how we assess and what we assess. And we're also identifying a challenge in ensuring consistency and authenticity among different instructors and assessments as we're bringing this to scale. And then we also can disaggregate our data. Um, for example, I'm showing disaggregated data by economic status, DPS, and first generation. We've never had access to this kind of data before. And so um, we hope that this framework of assessing at the level of institutional learning outcomes, but within coursework, is also going to be useful for assessing program and specific course SLOs in Canvas using the exact same framework. It'll give us this same data. And again, this allow, this disaggregation allows us to see where we are at the at this point in time. Um, and this data dashboard is accessible to all our faculty and they can go in and take a look at the data at any time and kind of evaluate where they are and where we all are at um, any given moment. So that's my presentation. Shannon, <clears throat> thank you, Shannon. Shannon, quick question. Um, it's nice to see that uh, the change from institutional to the OASIS, what were the struggles uh, that you had, you know, from the faculty? Going from Very little. The, the biggest concern was just the fact that it was in Canvas and in a data dashboard, there was concern from some faculty, very few, that this would somehow be tied to evaluations. And I pointed out that actually we have a line in our contract that student learning outcomes evaluation is in no way tied to evaluations, that the um, contract requires that faculty participate in student learning outcomes assessment and program review, but not that they, but, but it's actually, there's a separate line item that says, in no way can the student learning outcomes results be included or involved or even looked at as part of the evaluation process. And so that seemed to take away any concerns faculty had. And um, I really have not had much at all in the way of pushback. Actually, faculty are really grateful that uh, this is, they don't have to do any extra work, that the data is being provided for them and that this is just integrated seamlessly into their coursework. Thank you, Megan. 
Hi, thank you. I have a very specific question, <laughs> um, and it's really about the assessment data itself and how it was done in Canvas, because we're struggling right now with having institutional learning outcomes, program learning outcomes, um, and course learning outcomes and module level outcomes. And I guess what I'm wondering is, do you have an outcome row in Canvas specific to the institutional learning outcome? And then do you have one for the program learning outcome that's aligned? And then do you have one for the course learning outcome? Like, how are you doing that? <laughs> so how we are doing that is through our grant, we hired a consultant whose job it was to build the infrastructure in Canvas. And what that person did was, um, she built a folder of ACES outcomes mm -hmm. and that folder is integrated into every Canvas shell. Um, and therefore faculty, when they create a rubric in Canvas, they can click add outcome and they can automatically import any of those ACES outcomes into that uh, assignment rubric. Um, the next steps are going to be to do the same build, a folder of program learning outcomes and a folder of course SLOs, but because it has to be done at the administrative level, but the folders have to be assigned appropriately into Canvas because, you know, for example, the biology program should not be able to see or assess, let's say, I don't know, history program learning outcomes that'll create mass confusion right and so and likewise for individual course learning outcomes folders we don't want let's say physiology learning outcomes trying to be assessed in a gen bio course that will confuse faculty it might confuse students and it will be ugly so we have to be very careful how we build the infrastructure for that but the consultant we hired knows how to do all of that and those are those are going to be our next steps after we get through all of our three cohorts of um with their first round of aces assessment in program review okay thank you thank, thank you megan uh jed yes shannon fantastic work great presentation gosh this is this is really exciting thank you thank you very much i do have a question if you could please elaborate a little bit about the uh, digital micro credentials and how how do you actually work with students? How how does it how do, how how do faculty make it work? So we have created um, got, uh, so that's a there's so much to that it could be its own presentation. So I'll just try and be brief. Our career center contacts students. Uh, they run data. I think either every two weeks or every month. They identify students who have demonstrated mastery of an outcome, achievement or mastery of a particular outcome twice because that's the threshold we set. They then notify students who have met that requirement that they have earned a digital micro credential and that they can check their Badger account, which is available through our um, student portal. They can check their Badger account to see what badges and tokens they've earned so far. And the Career Center invites them to workshops to learn about the skill they have mastered, how they can put it on LinkedIn, and how they can build their skills resume. Um, from a faculty standpoint, we have created and shared through Canvas Commons a, uh, so a page that faculty can include in their introductory module and syllabus uh, documentation to introduce ACEs in the syllabus. And um, they how, how they talk to students about ACEs outcomes when they are interacting with students. And so we've built all this infrastructure. It's all available in Canvas Commons. Um, we have a specific tag for our institution so our folks know how to find it and import all of those things, including pre-built ACEs assessments with rubrics built in that they can import into their courses. And so faculty really have uh, lots of resources to support them. And the students also have lots of student facing resources um, to make it easy uh, for them to use and engage in the badges. And I'll just wrap up by saying that 
the students are so stoked about these badges. Right. Um, we're not here to give badges. We're here to assess learning outcomes. So I have to keep reminding everyone of that. But the students are just like, oh, I've got three out of my four outcomes done. Where, right. What class can I take to finish my communication badge? You know, they're right. super excited about it. I've never seen it anything like it before. So it's really cool. Yes, it does change the focus. Excellent. Thank you again, Shannon. I we are we are short on time. And Enrica, let's let's go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mary. Uh, Shannon, wonderful presentation. Thank you once again. Uh, our next presenter, Trisha. And I'm, I'm thinking you're uh, uh, presenting along with Jennifer together. Is that right, Trisha? Yes. So uh, I will. I think you all can see my screen now. Yes. So I will be um, sharing uh, many of the slides. And then when it comes to the data, I'm going to pass the ball to Jennifer so that she can share a little bit more in detail data. Um, so so it, uh, I just wanted to start by saying uh, that Beth and Shannon did uh, a wonderful job. Uh, they set uh, such a good precedent. And I feel like while all of our presentations cover alignment and while there is some wonderful overlap in all of them, um, it's so to see the different things our institutions are doing to align our outcomes work and to ensure that as students pass through every level of our institution that they're really uh, acquiring and obtaining the outcomes that we promise them when they enter our institution. So anyway, it's just it's phenomenal to see. Um, okay. So at LBCC, uh, today we want to talk a little bit about how we align our course SLOs, and we call them CSLO, PSLO, ISLO. Um, but anyway, we align our course SLOs to both our program SLOs and to our institutional SLOs. Um, so what is alignment? You all have seen this a couple times now, uh, but it's really evaluating the inherent connections or uh, in certain situations, right, creating more intentional connections between the skills and competencies students acquire in their courses and those broader skills and competencies that they develop in a program or at an institution. Um, and then the goal of this alignment is to, to use it to assess our program student learning outcomes and our institutional student learning outcomes. So we're not aligning or mapping for the sake of aligning and mapping. We're aligning and mapping uh, for the sake of ensuring that our students are learning. Um, Okay, so what are some of the prerequisites for alignment? Uh, we found that at our institution, it required a campus commitment, it required training, and it required a lot of support. Um, and so there were many folks that we had to get on board and to buy in. Uh, folks like our myself, our curriculum chair, our dean of academic affairs, our director of planning, Jennifer, who's here today, our department heads and our program faculty, right? Um, we offered a lot of training, presentations and workshops, and a lot of these presentations and workshops, uh, because our mapping or our alignment has to continually stay up to date, uh, these presentations and workshops uh, have to happen in an ongoing way. And then uh, related to support, really when we're asking faculty to map, we have to give really clear instructions, we need user templates, uh, there need to be reminders and the one-on-one -on -one support to make it happen. Um, so I'm not going to go ahead and read through these slides. The slides really are meant for you all to have as a resource after the presentation. But I just wanted to share a little bit about what our CSLO to PSLO mapping process looked like, and then to show you some of the templates and the documents that we use to, to make it happen. Um, so we decided to provide a spreadsheet to each of our departments. And each of these spreadsheets came pre-filled with the courses, the course SLOs, whether it's a required course for the program or an elective. Um, they, we asked our faculty to then look at that, uh, those, that content along with their program outcomes, which were also placed into the spreadsheet for them, and to copy and paste um, the course at the program SLOs into the row where the course SLOs are. Uh, if they wanted it to be aligned, uh, or if they felt like there was that inherent or uh, connection, or they were trying to intentionally create that connection. Um, we also let them know that if they didn't feel like a particular course SLO mapped to their program SLOs, 
uh, they were they could elect not selected for mapping. They're the content experts, uh, like uh, the my colleagues before me have shared. We don't want to say anybody has to do anything. We want to present it to them, ask them to create the. But if they feel like something doesn't align or map specifically, then we're not requiring um, them to map every course SLO to a program SLO. And then one thing we also did was we asked faculty to indicate the level uh, at which the PSLO is addressed. So was the PSLO content introduced, was it reinforced, or was it mastered through that course SLO content? And so again, I'm not going to go through these, but, but we provided this content to our faculty so that they knew what those different levels of mastery meant, and so that everybody could be on the same page. Um, and then uh, um, I'm going to let Jennifer share more about this later, but uh, again, this data point then becomes so helpful because when we look at the um, program SLO dashboard, we can see our students struggling as this PSLO content is introduced, or are they struggling more at the master's level, right? Where do we need to um, integrate or where do we need to take action to make sure our students walk away from our programs with the learning that we, we promise to deliver them? So this is what our template looks like. Um, so you can see here at the bottom, um, this was sent to our computer and office studies department. And at the bottom, you can see a list of all of their awards that they needed to work with mapping. And so the name of the award is in this column, the course and its corresponding SLOs are here. What was required or not is here, right? So then I asked faculty to do was consider, okay, these are the program student learning outcomes. Please copy and paste if you think that there's the alignment, if this course SLO, BCOM 15 course SLO 1 maps to PSLO 2, copy and paste it there. And then use this drop down in column G here to indicate the level of PSLO mastery. Is it reinforced, mastered? And then again, both in the copying and pasting option and in the level of mastery option, um, faculty were have selected that. It's not, they didn't, they weren't selecting it for mapping. Um, okay. Uh, when faculty finished their work, um, it, their mapping could have looked something like this. So um, this was for our art history, AAT. And so faculty mapped the following course SLOs here to this PSLO at the top. And they indicated these levels of mastery and whether the core required core course or not. And here were the courses that were not selected for mapping. So then, you know, because sometimes courses are selected to be modified or course SLOs or program SLOs are modified or new ones are created or cer certain ones are inactivated, our course SLO to program SLO mapping has to be updated, right? And so we have that uh, take place as part of our supplemental program review process, which occurs every two years for our CTE programs and every three years for our non-CTE programs. So when faculty need to update their mapping, they receive the same spreadsheet um, with some additional indicators, but essentially every row that they need to address then is, is highlighted in yellow. Um, we give them a little indicator of what they need to do or what the change was. And we ask them to follow their mapping updates instructions here and turn the row green when they've completed their task. Because then when we receive it back, we can make the updates to all of the rows in green so that when our data dashboard, um, when folks receive their results via the dashboard, uh, of course, they receive the the most up-to-date and accurate results with the most up-to-date and accurate language for all of our course and program SLOs and for the mapping that so diligently on. And so this is our PSLO dashboard. And so I'm going to pause here, uh, stop sharing, and give Jennifer the opportunity to uh, the data unless we need to ask any, uh, unless we need to answer questions before Jennifer shares.
Trisha, I think there's just one question in the chat about if there are challenges having CTE and non-CTE on different um, program review schedules. So when we talk about um, supplemental program review, this is actually an additional program review in, in addition to our annual program review. We do an annual planning and program review process every year. Our supplemental program review process are components um, of program review that we determine faculty do not need to um, look at on an annual basis. They look at success rates, completion, transfer, um, fill rates, these types of metrics annually. And in our supplemental program review, um, we primarily look at our labor market data um, for our CTE programs, which is on a two-year cycle in um, relation to ed code requirements um, and we um, for labor market data. And then that's where we incorporate the program SLOs as well as a few other additional components that um, faculty review. And we haven't really had any problems with having CTE and non-CTE on different program review schedules. Um, there are a few departments that have both CTE and non-CTE programs in them and they've determined whether they wanna just have all of their programs on a two-year cycle or they're on a three-year cycle. And we do a staggered cycle too. So about a third of our programs, regardless of if they're CTE or non-CTE, are going through the supplemental program review process in this at the same time in the spring each year. And so we've done it that way for quite some time. So um, I think, I mean, maybe going on 10 years of having a cycle like that. So I don't think that we, I mean, I think at this point, everyone is mostly used to that. Um, so at this point, I'm going to share my screen, like Trisha mentioned, and show you a little bit about the data. And so we utilize Tableau at Long Beach City College um, to visualize all of our student learning outcomes um, results. And here you're looking at our program student learning outcome results dashboard um, and actually let me take off this filter. And we're specifically looking at um, our ADT for elementary teacher education. Um, this ADT has two program SLOs um, and you can see those right here. We have our program name, um, we have our program SLOs, um, and then we have um, our overall um, uh, percent of achievement on each of these program SLOs based on all of the course results um, from the course SLOs that are mapped to each of these program SLOs. And um, for this example, we across the board for all of our programs um, through our assessment of student learning outcomes subcommittee approved a 70% um, expected level of achievement for every single program SLO. And so for this example, when we're taking a look at our ADT and elementary teacher education, we can see that for both of our program SLOs, um, neither of these met the expected level of achievement. They were very close, um, but they weren't quite there yet. Um, and um, what we ask faculty to do is not only look at the overall results um, at the program SLO level, but to also examine um, the course SLOs that are mapped to each and what those results look like. And so when we take a look at our first program SLO for elementary teacher education, um, we can see that there are um, three main courses, a child development course, an education course, and a math course that are mapped um, to this specific program SLO. Um, and there's a few SLOs in some cases um, for some of these courses that are mapped as well. And you could see over here, like Trisha showed you um, in the Excel spreadsheets, that we also include the level of mastery um, for each of those course SLOs when we display the results um, here. And so um, when, we, when we drill down to this level, what we can see is where those differences lie. And so we can see for program SLO 1, um, for education 20, and for um, math, uh, 28, um, that we are really meeting that expected level of achievement for these two um, course SLOs. Um, so the areas of focus in this case would really be on um, our child development course, as well as our um, math SLO2 here. And this is a unique program in the sense that, you know, it's very interdisciplinary. So the courses leading up to the program, most of them aren't, you know, owned per se by the department where this award lives. And so, um, looking at these results, um, it, it is really something that um, this um, program really looks at in an interdisciplinary way with working with these different areas um, to analyze these results. And so um, with this data, we also encourage faculty to dive a little bit deeper even into the course SLOs. And as we are looking at these SLOs, we also want to see um, you know, where do equity gaps potentially lie? And so we can take a look at um, our disaggregation by gender, 
by modality and by race ethnicity, as well as required courses for majors. Um, but we primarily focus on um, gender, modality, and race ethnicity in our analyses and actions. And so I'm just going to click on race ethnicity here. Um, so you can see the breakdown of students scores on these mapped course SLOs. And we ask each area to really do an analysis of this equity data. You know, where are we seeing gaps in relation to the highest performing group? Um, why might that be? And really um, have discussions about how to support these student groups um, and close equity gaps whenever they are identified. So you can see um, here for Math 28, um, we have our Asian students as the highest performing group um, and our Black African American students have our largest equity gap. Um, and so this would be an area of focus, working with both elementary teacher education faculty as well as our math faculty to kind of identify some strategies to improve student learning in this instance. Um, another example that I wanted to show really quickly, um, and Trisha, please jump in if I've missed anything before I move on. Okay. Um, is um, an example where we do see that a program is meeting the expected level of achievement um, for each of their program SLOs. And in this case, we have our associate degree in fire science. Um, and you can see here they have two program SLOs, both are above that 70% level of achievement. Um, and we do still ask, um, you know, even when areas are meeting the expected level of achievement, many times what we find is that as we dig further into the data, um, there are still some areas of focus and improvement um, that um, could be a potential focus for actions to take to improve student learning. And so when I show all of the different fire courses, I'm going to go to um, PSLO2 here, um, which has many fire courses mapped to it with different course SLOs mapped. And we can see here that in FIRE 3, um, SLO, course SLO 2 um, is an area that might be foca a focus for the faculty as they're looking at their program SLO results um, to help not only increase the program SLO results overall, but also help support the students in accomplishing this course SLO. And the same goes for FIRE 4, where we see one course SLO that isn't meeting that expected level of achievement um, here as well. But for FIRE 5, we see that um, for all of the course SLOs, we are meeting those expected level, levels of achievement. Um, we, when we disaggregate further, we do find um, additional areas for improvement related to equity. And so, um, you can see here, I'm just going to point to FIRE 5, um, which we saw overall as meeting the expected level of achievement. But when we disaggregate this data, we do see that at some equity gaps exist for Pacific Islander students in course SLO 2 that is mapped at the reinforced level, um, as well as course SLO 3 um, for our Black African American students um, at the um, at, at the reinforced level as well. And so these would be areas that we encourage faculty to focus on. Um, and this dashboard has been really helpful. We developed it, I think, two years ago um, to really um, provide easily accessible information at many different levels to faculty so that they're not just looking at the program SLO results overall, but we're able to really identify those specific focuses for improvement at the course SLO levels that will not only increase those program SLO results over time and support student learning, but also um, close our equity gaps um, at the course level and ultimately at the program level as well. So that's really um, you know, the focus for our college is, is that focus on equity. Trisha, did you want to add anything? Jennifer, great question. Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, some uh, uh, private chats here. Is this, your assessments are done at the student level or at the course level? At, uh, they're done um, at the course SLO level. So how do you, how do you get the disaggregate data if, it's, if they're not done at the student level? Oh. So let me clarify that. So they're done at the student level in the sense that the data is gathered for every course SLO through Canvas at the student level. So students are taking these course SLO assessments in Canvas. And through Canvas, we can collect the student ID numbers, um, which we then match with our student information system, PeopleSoft, to get um, the disaggregated data. So we could actually include a lot more disaggregations if we wanted to look at, you know, um, additional student characteristics. Um, but right now our assessment of student learning outcomes subcommittee has decided to focus on gender, race, ethnicity, and modality. But that's how we connect it is through the student ID numbers collected in Canvas for every assessment that students take. 
Thank you. And one more, if you don't mind, I do apologize. And what is that threshold that you have? Is, is it 70%? 70%. Consider, consider success? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. And, and actually, Enrique, that is our expected level of achievement or consideration of success for every level at the institution, for our course level SLOs, for our program level SLOs, and for our institutional level SLOs. Um, our assessment of student learning outcome subcommittee has set that as the standard for expectation. And so when we're analyzing and acting on that data, um, if our if any of our course or program or institutional level SLOs don't meet the expected level of achievement, um, we are we that's our area of focus for you know taking of action to improve student learning. But if all of our course SLOs or program SLOs or institutional SLOs do meet the expected level of achievement, then we still emphasize uh, analysis and action to work toward uh, continuous improvement. So just because we meet uh, an expected level of achievement doesn't mean we aren't looking at the data. Um, it just means that rather than figuring out how to how to get students to meet the expected level of achievement, we're working toward refining maybe even further. And OK, now how can we meet this um, goal that we have for our students or how can we focus in on our disaggregated data even more to close these equity gaps, right? So anyway, we look at, of course, overall data and equity data for everything, but we're either striving to meet the expected level of achievement or we're striving toward continuous improvement. So there's always room to grow when it comes to student learning. Thank you. And there was a, a message in the chat. Uh, how do you handle the, the desired data when you have a small number or, you know, six or five students or so? Yeah, so um, in the dashboards, we do um, high data when it's five or less students. Um, and so that data isn't displayed, but you're right, there is some smaller groups of six or eight students. Um, keep in mind that we've only been assessing on Canvas for a few years. So our hope is that as we gather more data, you know, these numbers will increase and we'll be able to see some bigger trends over time. Um, but we do when we see these small groups, I mean, there's a lot of variability in the data um, when it becomes a very small group, because if one student doesn't achieve the SLO, that's going to change the percentage very greatly. And so we do try to emphasize and exercise caution in the interpretation when there is a very small group of students um, and what their SLO assessment results look like. Um, and many times we encourage, you know, kind of waiting to um, really determine actions based on that until we have a little bit more data to get a better understanding of like, was this, you know, by chance or was this really, um, you know, a trend that we're seeing that we really need to focus on. Thank you. Uh, Kirsten, would you like to speak to your uh, questions? Sure. So, um, just to so I can understand if there's more sort of math happening behind the scenes of the screens that you were showing us, if you are looking at achievement for one course SLO across a row there, are there multiple assessments that come up with the percentage that you're reporting in that dashboard or is it just one like a one to one correlation, and if you have multiple assessments what I'm trying to figure out is like how do you decide if one of the assessments shows that like students are really achieving well. And another one shows that they're not and how do you manage that with the getting coming to one number right this kind of i'm just trying to figure that part out yeah right so at this point um our faculty have collectively authored an slo assessment for a course level so or for for an slo so there's really only one assessment so there's an assessment for say slo1 an assessment for slo2 and an assessment for slo3 um, next week, I think we're going to be presenting a little bit more on uh, direct assessment and rubrics, and so you'll be able to see a little bit um, related to, for example, you know, there's an SLO that we want to assess, but multiple things go into achieving that particular SLO. And so we have um, the ability in Tableau, especially when it comes to course level assessment, to break it down by rubric category level or quiz question level to get to the intricacies of those uh, components when we're analyzing and acting on course level data. But when we look at the program level data, we're kind of looking for more of those aggregate scores and looking at student achievement, you know, really more at the program level. So again, uh, well, not again, it just focuses on that one assessment and maybe not as detailed as the course level analysis maybe would be. 
Um, but sometimes because we're at the program level and so many courses and their SLOs align, we're able to see certain themes or trends emerge that we wouldn't have been able to see at the course level. So, so there's the, the benefit in that way too at, at looking at the, the course mapping that leads to the program level data. Thank you, Tricia and Jennifer. Uh, Janet, do you have any questions? I, I think there's one. Um, Chara is asking in the in the chat. Um, yes, she has two, at least two questions. Uh, would you mind elaborating on this? Uh, Chara Log Logli. Hi, good morning, everybody. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, I have two yes. questions for any of the presenters. The first question is, uh, in the first presentation, I heard uh, PLOs for the Spanish courses. So I am wondering if uh, um, the presenters who are in a liberal arts degrees, do you have PLOs for liberal arts as a whole? Or do you have PLOs for uh, the subunits? let's say Spanish, uh, um, biology, oceanography. The second question is, I have heard that the mapping course to program, program to institution. But I'm wondering if anybody like us is a mapping course to program, course to institution directly because we only collect data at the course level. And so we didn't want to go through the middle step uh, of uh, um, program to institution. I don't, know, I don't know if I'm making sense. Chara, for question number two, the second portion of our presentation uh, is, goes into ILOs or ISLOs. And we do, we at LBCC do map course SLOs directly to institutional student learning outcomes. So I can, uh, Jennifer and I will go into a little bit more detail in a few minutes, but maybe um, we could answer your question one before we move on. Yeah, and this is perfect. I'm so glad that you are doing that because I thought, oops, maybe I'm the only one here. So thank you. I feel so relieved. So the, the question really is the, the first part of the question, right? For the liberal arts program, do you have PLLs for the whole uh, program or, or for subunits? I, I think that really depends on the institution, how it's configured. I, I don't know if I can add anything to this because the, I, I don't think that there is any specific structure that everybody has to follow. Uh, normally, courses amount to programs, amount to uh, institutional uh, effectiveness or institutional outcomes. So I, I think how that's structured within each program, how it's structured within the diploma program or certificate, that's that's up to individual institutions. If there's anyone who has more information on this, you're, you're welcome to comment. But that would be my understanding. Amanda, would you like to elaborate? No, you already did it perfect. I think it's it's so mm -hmm. individualized based on how the degrees are configured and what structure works for, for the college. Yeah. <clears throat> Great, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, great. Let's uh, let's move on with the second part of your presentation then. Thank you, Tricia. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Sounds great. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Okay, so this is just the, the, the last section of ISLOs is that once we have all of that wonderful data in Tableau, right? Um, our program faculty get together and they analyze those results, looking at all those things that Jennifer um, so helpfully pointed out um, with, with the programs, with the course level mapping, with the level of mastery, with the other filters uh, for disaggregation. And they collectively determine what kind of actions they want to take in order to make meaningful change. Um, and so that's the, that's the part of the process where we really end up having the ability to close the loop, right? We've assessed, we've analyzed, and now our program faculty get together and they take that action to, to improve their students' learning. Okay, so this I think is more to Chiara's question and, and we'll get into ISLOs here. So our ISLO mapping process and instructions uh, looked a little bit like this. 
Uh, we provided each department with a list of all of the department's course SLOs that currently were housed under uh, our general education plan A, right? So they got a list. These are all of the SLOs on GE plan A that belong to your department. And we provided them with this form here, the CSLO to ISLO mapping form. And we asked them to conduct a very narrow mapping of their, their department CSLOs to the college's ISLOs. Uh, what I mean by narrow is that, as you can see on the form, we asked them to select no more than two course SLOs from their department for the ISLO. Uh, this is because we didn't want it to be kind of a, a big uh, dump where everything in the kitchen sink went in. We wanted to get a, a really intentional mapping uh, so that we could really determine, okay, where are our students mastering our institutional learning outcomes content or where are they not? Um, and so we conducted a very narrow mapping um, and every department could select two of their best SLOs, the cream of the crop, the, the, the ones that would be most intentionally aligned from the course level to the institution level. And then once we received the submissions, our assessment of student learning outcomes subcommittee reviewed and either approved or rejected the department submissions. I don't mean rejected in a negative way. I just mean that we conducted a second layer of review to say, mm, this might be a stretch or we think this might fit better somewhere else. Um, or, you know, we just don't think this is a, a good fit for this ISLO and we would take it back to the department. Um, so once we had all of that together, then we take that mapping and that ISLO mapping leads to a direct assessment, okay? So we take all of those courses that were mapped and we adapted the value rubrics um, to match what goes on at our institution. And every faculty member who teaches a course that is mapped to our ISLO has to evaluate their individual students on Canvas according to this ISLO rubric. So every student gets a direct assessment of what their level of proficiency is related to this ISLO by virtue of their time spent in that faculty member's course. And ultimately, we have Tableau, right? And so Tableau aggregates those scores and presents the data visually to us. And so uh, once again, I'm going to pass the ball to Jennifer um, and let her show you a little bit around the dashboard. All right, thanks, Tricia. So let me pull up the dashboard. Um, this dashboard looks a little bit different than the one that we were looking at before, um, but you can see here we have um, all five of our ISLOs that we can select from um, to examine results um, at this level. And I will caveat this by saying that uh, we have gone through the assessment cycle with this new process once. And so we just have one set of data right now to look at. We've actually been collecting data um, since then and we'll be analyzing and acting on that data again this year. We have a two year ISLO assessment cycle. And so we're really looking forward to um, kind of seeing the data this year and seeing, you know, um, if there are any differences or improvements um, this time around. And so um, when you're taking a look here, you can see ISLO 4 is related to critically and ethically engaging in global and local issues with sensitivity to the diversity of individuals, groups, and cultures. Um, and down here, we can see um, how many students participated in the different in the assessment um, based on the course SLO mapping. And so we had 1,401 students who participated in this assessment. Um, and our overall score was at 74%. And so similar to our course and program levels, like Trisha mentioned, we have a 70% expected level of achievement for all of our SLOs at each level. Um, and so we can see that we met that here overall. Um, when we ask faculty to examine the data and for institutional student learning outcome assessment, this is our assessment of student learning outcome subcommittee members that would be taking a look at this dashboard and analyzing this data. Um, we first asked to kind of take a look at that overall score and then take a look at the different um, the, the breakout of um, the different scores um, on the rubric. And so you can see that about 10% of students um, were scored at the limited proficiency level, 2% was, or sorry, 24% with some proficiency, 26% um, with proficiency, and then we had 40% at the excellence um, 
level of that rubric rating. Um, but we do also um, have a few additional breakouts um, that we ask um, our faculty to look at. And one of those is um, unit completion. And so for our institutional student learning outcomes, um, many of our courses that are mapped are general education courses that may not have prerequisites. And so we may have students who are brand new to the college enrolling in these courses, as well as students who are getting close to um, uh, completion that are enrolling as well. And we really wanted to focus in on are those students who are getting close to completion um, achieving proficiency on each of our institutional student learning outcomes. And for our institutional student learning outcome four, we can see that overall um, the majority of students um, scored a three or above on this rubric. And so they were really meeting proficiency. Um, but what um, ended up happening as a result of looking at these institutional student learning outcome assessment results the first time around was we really also started focusing in on these students um, from zero to 14 units um, who had completed very few units. They were new students to the college. Um, and so paying attention to, you know, the course SLOs that are mapped here, um, you know, students are not um, achieving the student learning outcome at the same level as these students who are nearing completion of um, their awards. And so we had a lot of discussions about um, these zero to 14 unit students, especially um, as we disaggregated the data um, by race ethnicity, um, where you can really clearly see that um, for our zero to 14 unit students, there were some equity gaps there um, in wow average scores on the rubric and so specifically for our black African American students and our Latinx students um, who had completed um, like one to 14 units at the college and they were enrolled in these courses that were mapped to the institutional student learning outcome and so many of our actions focused on you know how do we close the equity gap for these students it's great that we're seeing um, our students nearing completion here um, that are achieving um, these higher scores but we are currently looking into kind of you know, what happened with these students? Um, did they persist at the college? Um, you know, taking a deeper dive into this data um, from a few different angles in addition to student learning outcomes um, to see really, you know, what should we be focusing on? I um, mean, of course, we're collecting more data to see trends over time as well, because we only have one set of data here that we're looking at um, from a previous fall. Um, but we can also um, disaggregate the data by gender as well. And similarly, we saw an equity gap for our female students at the zero to 14 unit um, completion level when we're disaggregating. And so um, this has really become a big focus for our assessment of student learning outcomes subcommittee is um, focusing on supports for these students. Maybe these are courses that should be recommended on our roadmaps um, toward the end of a student's journey, um, but we are really looking into um, more information about that and determining, you know, what types of actions could we take to close those equity gaps at that um, level, but also determine, you know, are there additional things we need to do um, with incoming students who are taking some of these courses that are mapped to our institutional student learning outcome assessment. Trisha, do you have anything to add? I don't. I think you did a wonderful job. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. Yarek, you have a question? I, I do, I do actually, because that's, you know, when you when you talk about this uh, desegregation of data, right, along the outcomes and then uh, course completion and, uh, you know, like fitting this SLO assessment uh, phenomena into the current semester structure, how, how do faculty react to this? Do, uh, what, what's, what's your experience with, 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 with teachers who deliver this and, and, and how do they react to, 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 to this data? Yark, which specific data are you talking about? Sorry, I, uh, I didn't. What, what Jennifer just showed us, right, that there are certain students who are uh, doing very well at the end of the course, perhaps, or, or, or there are students who are not performing as well at the beginning of the course. So faculty, I imagine, are giving this information, right? So the question really is, do they react to it in any specific instructional uh, interventions or, or, or activities that will happen in the classroom that, that will uh, help faculty narrow those uh, equity gaps? Jennifer, do you want to take that or should I? Do you, you can take it and I can I can chime in if you want. Sure. So yes, Yarek, the, 
the just one point of clarification the zero to 14 it's not in the beginning of a course and at the end of a course it's at the beginning of their academic journey and the end of that their academic journey because it's the number of units that they have completed at the institution um and yes this information is shared out it's shared out at aslo it's shared out to the curriculum committee to the academic senate to the board of trustees so this information has really been disseminated um right. and i think then that, that also, another thing that the ASLO subcommittee did is they, uh, when we looked at this data initially, we really also were very intentional at looking at the vice president level plans, uh, part of the, our annual planning and program review process to see where the actions that we had taken were aligning with these so that we could ensure that our actions would be worked into the fabric of the institution, right? And or if there were actions that were not covered, um, we looked at maybe, you know, what committee work is being done related to this and who can we communicate related to these with related to these actions. Um, and then, of course, having shared it out at curriculum and at Academic Senate, um, we're very hopeful and we believe that the content and information is also shared at the department level uh, from our representatives so that faculty can be aware of this and, you know, take the action at their level um, mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. for this new invention and to address student learning um, at, in this way. Right, yes, it, it, it certainly looks like it's a not on the department, but really college-wide, if not district-wide uh, activity efforts. So it's it's just uh, tremendous. It's it's very, very important for us to hear this. Thank you so much, uh, Tricia. Enrique. A uh, question for Tricia or Jennifer. What were the lessons learned uh, from mapping uh, your course SLOs to the institutional uh, SLOs versus the course program institutional? Well, I guess I've been working in this role as the coordinator for two years, uh, well, almost three now. And so when I began my time as the coordinator um, was when we made the decision, we're going to map course to program and course to institutional. So mm -hmm. I don't know that I could say lesson. I don't know that I could convey quite lessons learned or why we did what we did, but uh, I feel that our course to program SLO mapping, um, just the, the level of work required to create those spreadsheets, to communicate it with the department, and to make sure the updates are happening in a regular way, it, it's time intensive and it requires work. Um, I think our course to ISLO mapping, the way that we set it up, um, there was maybe a little bit of a lift at the beginning to get the course at that are on GE Plan A, but it wasn't as heavy a lift. And I think that that process um, has been a, a little easier and a little easier to maintain. I, I will just add to that. Um, we have gone through iterations of ISLO assessment at Long Beach City College where we weren't finding much meaning in the ways that we were doing ISLO assessment before. Mm -hmm. um, we used to use the, um, I can't even remember what the acronym stands for anymore, but we used to use the SESI uh, survey results. Um, and right. we would add, um, we would add questions to this national survey um, to focus in on our ISLOs, um, but it wasn't really giving us the information that we needed to really focus in on what are specific improvements that we could make um, at the course level to really support students in achieving their institutional student learning outcomes. And as we were developing um, assessment on Canvas and we were really building capacity to build Tableau dashboards, um, this was really an opportunity to, um, to uh, re-look at how we assess institutional learning outcomes and map the courses to the institutional. And I think one of the reasons we chose to um, focus on course SLOs as opposed to program SLOs is, um, you know, with, with mapping to the program SLO level, um, or from the program SLO to the ISLO level, um, you don't always know exactly what is 
impacting those program SLOs, right? Because there's course SLOs mapped to them. And by mapping directly from the course SLO level to the institutional level, we can determine exactly what courses there may need to be improvement in student learning, as well as disaggregating that data and looking for equity gaps. And so we can really focus in and pinpoint on the specific areas that we need to focus on and support in order to achieve those institutional student learning outcomes. When we've looked at it at the program SLO level, it sometimes, as you saw with the program SLO dashboard, and we're diving into the course SLOs, it reveals a lot more. Um, so you could be achieving a program SLO level re really well, but some course SLOs within there may need some more focus and attention. Um, same with the disaggregated data. And so we really chose to just go directly that from that course level to the institutional level to get some answers on the areas of focus that um, we should be focused on in our courses. Jennifer, you are so correctly, uh, correctly on what you said. Uh, we are using, it was the SANS and the uh, SESI surveys, if you recall. Uh, those were the, uh, the way we evaluated the institutional learning outcomes, right? And uh, yeah, yeah you're, you're totally right. Uh, they don't measure the, you know, the skills and competencies. And so, uh, sadly, we're still using those. Uh, and so, hopefully, we can get away from, you know, from those practices. Thank you. Yadik. All right, uh, let's see here. And um, Amanda made some comments. I'm reading the chat here about the uh, the databases, right? The, the different platforms that we have. That's that's sort of like, you know, and never ending saga. Um, uh, Trisha, I believe you did show us uh, a spreadsheet that, that, that faculty use, right? To enter their assessment data. I, I, can, I just got like, uh-huh. I can show a more interactive version. I just had showed a screenshot. If you had right. some, I'm happy to share that. In a sense that, you know, again, considering that we, we have Tableau and others, how, how you know, I, I, I'm, you know, again, we, we are going to be talking more about this. We do have a, a, another uh, Canvas and, and other technology solutions uh, talk uh, later in the semester. Um, why is it that we are using Excel? I mean, not, not that there is anything necessarily wrong with it. Apparently, it's, it's a good way to kind of like, you know, share it via email, right? And you're kind of like done. But... Gosh, it, it, it's it's almost begs the question: Why can't we have a some centralized system where you can just log in, enter this information, and kind of like be done? I think it would be nice, but I think that there hasn't been any system we found or any software found that has allowed us to do what we needed to do or what we felt was most intentional for the work that we were undertaking at our institution, and so we built our own. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, the user friendliness too of just like um, being comfortable with Excel and and knowing how kind of like that yeah. that spreadsheet works um, has really benefited us because what we found we've used softwares in the past and what we found is that you know our I may be in the software every day, but our faculty are in it at specific points of the year. And so because it's not a software that they're using every day, it gets frustrating sometimes to go in and kind of almost relearn it like at certain points this semester um, because it's not in it all. Jennifer, we're not hearing you very well. No. Trisha Jennifer just faded. Yes. It felt, it sounded like maybe your microphone got covered or something like that. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, I'm holding up my laptop, so I don't know what happened, <laughs> but I'll leave my camera off just in case too. Um, what was I saying? Oh, I was saying that, um, I don't know what you ended up hearing, but um, with institutional softwares, what our experience has been is because faculty are really going in and utilizing them only at certain points in the year. Um, whereas I would be in there almost every day, it's kind of like relearning the software at those certain points in the year. And it can get frustrating because you're not in it all the time. There's always, you know, a level of clunkiness to software sometimes, and it can get really frustrating. And by using Excel and something that most faculty are comfortable with um, in a, a template format, um, it has really helped us a lot to kind of go back to basics. And we've done that honestly in more ways than just SLOs, even for planning and program review, we, we, we use Word documents and Excel. Excel spreadsheets now we took it all out of software because the softwares can be so frustrating to use over time and so it's a little more work on our end um, as those developing the templates and then inputting the data into where it needs to go um, but it's worth it in the sense that it 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 allows for the focus to be on 
analyzing the results and taking actions and making assessment meaningful as opposed to trying to remember how to use the software and um and and focusing more on that as opposed mm -hmm. to having discussions about the data which is what we want to focus on indeed good 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 conversations right on well, let's see here. It's 11.51 on my clock. So uh, let's see. Any any other questions? Uh, Cynthia? Cynthia Lamberti, please uh, do speak up if you don't mind. Uh, not, not a question, actually a comment. Um, now I'm very intrigued about Tableau, but um, I attended all of these last year. And thank you for the free uh, presentations you're doing. I learned so much. And I got inspired to um, tie student demographics to our student learning data in canvas through something here i found out how to do get our ir person to help me do it and i we saw the gaps i presented to the faculty just yesterday handed them their tables and got them to start talking and um some of them were quite surprised at the gaps um and they you know they have that common phrase well we treat everyone the same well that might be but we're missing something and so I'm so thankful that um, information like this is being shared. Now I'm going to go look at Tableau <laughs> um, and, and just seeing all that that goes into making all of this happen. Um, much appreciated. It's going to make our accreditation visit much better. Awesome. Perfect. Very nice. Excellent. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much. Oh, OK. Can I, can I just say yes, one please, thing? Yes, please, Shannon. Um, to what Cynthia just said, um, just so you know, one of the one of the tension or friction points that I experienced with Tableau was I, I can't remember who, and it doesn't really matter. Somewhere along the way, someone was like, "Let's teach the faculty how to use Tableau." I put my foot down. I absolutely said no. That is not the faculty's responsibility to learn a new software to be able to analyze their own data. Part of the selling point of the whole ACES framework was that we would be providing the data to the faculty, that they didn't need to have to go through all this training and stuff to learn a whole new thing. I was really upset about it. I got really like, you know, emotional because there is no reason that all the faculty need to learn a whole new thing just to be able to do this work. In fact, it's the antithesis of what we were trying to do, which is make assessment sort of just this streamlined and embedded thing. And so I would, I would encourage you if you're going to explore Tableau to also explore how to find a team of people to provide the data that's needed from Canvas because it's not, I personally, my opinion is it shouldn't be another thing faculty have to learn to be able to evaluate their outcomes. That's not a solution. Shannon, if I could just add something to that, just from a different perspective. Um, so Tableau is all about the people who build the dashboards, right? And so we've tried to build all of our dashboards very consistently so that there isn't a big learning curve, that it's very obvious what you need to do. And what we found that faculty liked a lot, because we used to provide just the exact data, what, you know, in PDF kind of formats, tables, um, but now with the Tableau dashboards, um, and I haven't showed these ones here today, but we have enrollments, success rates, completions, and we have a multitude of filters for disaggregation. And faculty have really responded positively to that because they can look into their own questions that they have about the data. Um, and so mm -hmm. because they're all built very similarly, all the filters are in the exact same places. They all look pretty much the same, um, but it is really on like the IE standpoint, or I guess not IE standpoint, but the IE team to build things in a way that are usable in Tableau, because it's essentially starting with a blank slate. Um, and it really does allow, like, for example, in our en enrollments dashboard, we can disaggregate the data for our DSPS students, our EOPS students, our foster youth students, our justice scholars. Um, and we don't necessarily provide hundreds of pages of data to our faculty in all of these different viewpoints. But if they want to look at how their DSPS students are doing, if they want to look at how their EOPS students are doing, they have that opportunity to kind of dig into the data and ask questions themselves that we might not be able to provide them in a static um, version because we don't know exactly, each program is gonna have different focuses. And so it allows us to really um, 
I guess, give some ownership to the data and analysis back to our faculty um, so that if they have additional questions, a lot of the answers are in the, our dashboards. Um, but it is really on the team to build them in a user-friendly way because Tableau starts with a blank slate. And if you don't build them in a way that people can easily utilize and even incorporate feedback on them, it's not gonna be user-friendly and it is gonna be something that requires um, continuous training on. Um, but if you can build them in a way where everything's consistent and um, it doesn't require a lot of training. So just another thought, just from a different perspective and the experience that we've had at Tableau, with Tableau at our institution was we actually introduced it with very limited licenses and faculty liked it so much that um, they put it in their program plans as resource requests to get more licenses. And so we ended up making it a college-wide thing and it's really been a game changer at our college because faculty have really embraced it. Um, but that's just our college. So I know every college is unique. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Jedek, we have one information item, if you would. Can you see my screen? All right. Yes, yes. That's the uh, yeah. SLO symposium announcement, January 27 to 28. We we have sent out the uh, call for presenters. Uh, Jennifer, Tricia, gosh, this is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for, for your sharing and, and your expertise. It's, it's really extensive. You guys are doing magnificent work there. So we are all very happy that, that you're able to, to, to share this with us. Um, thanks again, everyone, for, for attending. It's almost 12 o'clock, so um, we'll see you next week. Um, again, thanks for the, thanks for the uh, uh, presentations. Um, they are just, 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 you know, I'm just, I'm just amazed at the, at, at the work that's, that's really been done. So um, thanks again, everyone. Uh, we'll see you next week.